This is a presentation from Winchester Academy. Then our speaker tonight is Tim Crane. Tim has been here several times before, so we, I think a lot of you already know who he is. Tim received a PhD in modern Europe, modern British and Irish, and modern Jewish history at Arizona State University. After er he did this after he'd earned his BA and MA from Marquette University. He has received numerous teaching and professional awards and in 2015, he received Marquette University's Alumni Award for Leadership Excellence. Please join me in welcoming back to Winchester Academy, Mr. Tim Crane. Uh, thank you. It's wonderful to be back uh, with all that. It's been actually a couple of years. And um, on the way up, I was thinking in terms of the fourth time I've been while I've had uh, uh, and and it's, a, it's actually a rather sad to start off because I know a, a good deal of you, a good many of you know Jack Rhodes very, very well. Uh, Jack is a dear friend of mine. We met at the Oracle at New Lawrence University, oh gosh, probably about 2008. And uh, we became very, very close friends. And in fact, that was the whole reason with the Winchester Academy that uh, uh, I ever came here. I was ever invited actually was because of Jack. So uh, just a, a remarkable human being, and uh, it's just really really sad that uh, he's no longer with us, but uh, you may know, always be a blessed memory, and I know for, for certain things, he uh, always will be. Uh, for the presentations, when I've been, uh, I've always talked about the fact that uh, my parents are originally from the London, Wisconsin, there's a lot of cranes over there, and I have crane cousins here today as well, so be on your best behavior. <laughs> they went me through it all, so uh, thank you so much for being here. But what I'd like to do this evening is to talk in terms of Russia and Ukraine. We'll spend some time on that to open the door for questions in terms of obviously. As historians, we're very more comfortable, I guess you'd say, with something that's at least 50 years old. So from the perspective of it, it's more than too recent, it's more for political science, like from 1974, 1975. It's considered a bit more recent. But what we will do here is we will go back in the past, look to see in terms of the historic relationship between these two nations and two independent nations in the present day, as well here as the present and projecting on to the future to have an essence of a better idea uh, as to what the future in fact may formally hold. Yeah. From the standpoint of the Russo-Ukrainian war in the present day, just in terms of a little bit of background information before we uh, uh, go into the past and then project onwards into the present, what you have here is a war that actually began in 2014 as the nation here of Russia formally annexed the Crimean Peninsula or the Ukrainian Crimea. Eastern part of the historic nation of Ukraine, what's known as the Donbass region. We hear a great deal in the news in the present day regarding the Donbass region. So this happened, there was a fair amount of international protest coming from the United States, coming from nations in Western Europe, but it wasn't anything over the top by any stretch of imagination. But in earlier this year, February of 2022, you have this massive invasion being launched here by the nation of Russia into Ukraine. The goal, the focus, the objective was to transform and destroy Ukraine, to make it here part of the Russian Federation, if at all possible. And what took the, or caught the Russians off guard, I would say, was first and foremost the response coming from the international community, particularly Western Europe and the United States condemning here this attack on Ukraine. And second of all, second of all, the level of Ukrainian resistance that in fact is formally put forth. Well, you have roughly over the course of this year, 36,000 Ukrainians have died in this war. A total of 20,000 Russians have been killed thus far. It represents the largest single war in 
all of Europe since World War II, which of course, of course formally concludes in 1945. And we also had the greatest refugee crisis here in the present day since going all the way back to the end of the Second World War in 1945. Well, here are the Russian tanks formally rolling in. This is in February, a photograph taken in February of this year. And this is, in fact, the region. So you can see here the independent nation of Ukraine with its capital city of Kyiv off to the north. And from the area here, is it okay if I move around with this? I just don't want to mess up. Okay. From the area here, you can see the Crimean. This was, was formally annexed in 2014. This area here, we start getting into the Donbass region. This was already under Russian control. And the goal, the focus, the objective was to, in fact, take down the rest of the nation here of Ukraine earlier this year. Well, it has not happened formally as of yet. But to get an idea in terms of these two respective powers, Russia and Ukraine, in the present day, we're going to go back in history because by understanding here the past, it gives a much better light, so to speak, on the present day. And the nation of Russia, literally for centuries, going all the way back to 1613, actually well before that, was ruled here by the Romanov dynasty or by a series of czars and empresses prior to the Romanovs. And you have, and it's imperative to understand this, European civilization is going to dominate the globe, going back to the 1100s, all the way into the early 20th century, to give you an exact year, 1915 when the United States emerges as the world's predominant power. But it had been here, from a global perspective, Europe was it. This was especially the case with Western Europe and the two great powers, Britain and France. By comparison, though, Eastern Europe tended to be very backward, always about 100 years behind the times. Yes, the agricultural revolution starts in Western Europe and eventually impact Eastern Europe in the 1100s as time moves on. But the Romanov rule here of Russia and the nation of Russia itself remains here a fairly backward entity. Well, in the late 1600s, Russia has a czar, Peter the Great. And what Peter the Great knows is he knows his nation of Russia is backward. So what he wants to do here, because he's very impressed with Western Europe, he wants to start reaching out and building, in essence, this window to the West. He will establish a second city here in historic Russia, second to Moscow, the city of St. Petersburg, which eventually becomes known as Leningrad, now is also known back as St. Petersburg in the present day. And he will take control here of what are these Baltic republics of Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania, and look towards westernizing here this nation, to bringing it up formally to speed because he sees it, in essence, as about 100 years behind the times, and quite frankly, he was correct. Well, as the decades progress here, Catherine the Great will become this other outstanding Romanov ruler. She will rule here about 100 years after Peter the Great, from 1762 to 1796. And what she is going to do, she's originally from the Germanic states, so she's already very much aware in terms of Western Europe and the goings on there, so to speak. And she starts pushing the border of Russia into other areas, into further parts of Eastern Europe. The nation of Poland that had been in existence for centuries is going to completely fall under Russian jurisdiction by 1796. It ceases to exist altogether. She will also push here the borders further south into Ukraine into Ukraine, which had been, it had been this independent state. But it's a classic example, and we see this time and time again in history, this whole attitude, this approach of might makes right. Stronger, more prominent nations take advantage of weaker nations. And Ukraine has, uh, suffers at this time from a lack of unity. It has its own identity. It has its own culture, as well as its own language across the board. But from the standpoint of Ukraine, here in the late 1700s, they are unable to resist the Russian autocracy, the Romanov dynasty here formally moving in. And the net result is that Ukraine is going to become part of the Russian Empire, as two have been the case with Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, as the Romanov dynasty is acquiring more and more land. 
Well, what the Russians attempted to do with the Ukrainians back in the late 1700s, early 1800s, is they added this Russification. They wanted to get rid of this Ukrainian language. They wanted to get rid of Ukrainian culture. They wanted basically to make the Ukrainians good Russians, to completely assimilate them if at all possible. Well, Ukraine had no interest, no interest whatsoever in this, and remained here this distinct entity, or at least how it viewed itself as. Well, as the 19th century progresses, the Industrial Revolution formally begins. We have these great waves in human history. We have the Agricultural Revolution begins in Europe in the 1100s, revolutionizes food production. In the late 1700s, early 1800s, we have the Industrial Revolution, also begins in Europe in the island nation of Britain. Changes here, life for each and every one of us, up to and including the present day. In the present, we're experiencing the technological revolution here across the board. I mean, it's mind-blowing. Think of what things were like 20 years ago compared to now. Think of what they'll be like 20 years into the future at this stage as technology continues here to improve to unbelievable proportions. Well, with the Industrial Revolution beginning here in Western Europe, it's going to impact Britain, it's going to impact France, it's going to impact the Germanic states. The nations of Western Europe will become these modern states. That will not happen in Russia. It will not happen here in Russia. And this czarist autocracy, which is here, in essence, tremendously struggling to bring here this nation into this modern period, is having a rough go of it as the late 19th century continues on into the early 20th century. Well, this is a photograph of the last czar of Russia, Tsar Nicholas II, who is seated, of course, in the center, and standing behind him in the center of the portrait, his wife, Alexandra, and their five children. He becomes Tsar of Russia in 1894. He will remain as Tsar until 1917. Here he is establishing, has, has established this very large imperial Russia, stretching here into vast areas, vast proportions of land, but by the same end, the nation is still second tier. It's still second class to the other nations, both in the central region of Europe as well as the western part. And to make a bad situation worse here for Russia and for Tsar Nicholas II is that he is going to get himself involved in the greatest war in human history up to that time, World War I, the war to end all wars. In the American doctrine, it's going to be the war to make the world safe for democracy. Well, one of the major problems here in terms of modernization and or industrial expansion and technology improving is you have here the weaponry of war becomes all the more potent. And here in World War I, the Allied powers, the two great West European powers, Britain and France, will be joined by Russia against the central powers, the predominant central power being the nation of Germany, also joined by Austria-Hungary, as well as the Ottoman Empire. What you have here in this war is it's oftentimes stated the true test of a nation's strength or weakness is to see how they do in war. If that nation performs well, they're a strong nation. If that nation falls apart, that's not good. Especially here, if you are not ready for war, this comes to the surface almost immediately. Russia had no business whatsoever getting itself involved in the Great War of 1914, a war that would take the lives of 15 million people, making it the single most destructive event in all of human history up to that time. Russia here is going to find itself, it is going to find itself facing all sorts of problems. Here as we look, here's our nation of Russia, here's Britain and France. The allied nations are in green. The central powers here are in this dark tan of Germany, the Austro-Hungarians. And what happens in World War I, what happens here in this war is that the war is going to be won or lost on the Western Front in France. However, there's also a very second prominent front, and that is in Eastern Europe and Russia. And the problem here is that the Russians can usually do well against the Austro-Hungarians, but they can't beat the Germans at all. And the war in Russia becomes all the more unpopular as time, in fact, formally moves on, and the, is imperative by 1917 for the Tsar, Nicholas II, to get his nation out of this war. 
Well, the nation is not going to leave the Allied side because it would mean certain defeat and the Allied powers by 1917. Now with the United States also joining shoulder to shoulder with Britain and France in this great war, they talk the Russians into staying in the war. The net result is that Russia is ripe for a major revolution. And in 1917, the Russian Revolution takes place. This czarist autocracy that, quite frankly, had kept Russia back in the Stone Age, what happens here is the czarist autocracy is overthrown, and you have the introduction of this new nation, a Marxist state, our first victory for communism in global history at this time, a new nation, the Soviet Union. Well, the Soviet Union comes into existence here in 1917, and the Soviet Union has a total of 15 republics. The largest of all the Soviet republics would be the Soviet Republic of Russia. And we talk about the United States from the perspective of being this great melting pot. Okay? And we are. We are a nation of immigrants. Quite frankly, all of us are our ancestors. Whether willing or unwilling, we're transported from somewhere else unless we're Native Americans. So you have this great melting pot here in the United States, and I would say at the end of the day it's worked very, very well. But in the historic Soviet Union, you have 15 republics with 180 distinct nationalities, speaking 130 different languages. The largest of all the Soviet republics, as I reference, is Russia. And Russia constitutes 52% of the population of this nation, this communist state, the Soviet Union. The second largest republic here in the Soviet Union, second largest is Ukraine. The Ukrainians constitute 24% of the population. The problem here fundamentally is that the Russians are going to rule the roost. The Russians dominate the communist Politburo, the Central Committee. They're overwhelmingly communist party members. And just like Imperial Russia and the aristocratic class, the boyer class and the czars, to be Russian puts you a step ahead, quite frankly, of everyone. Well, the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians here are having major issues with this because they represent 24% of the population, but they're treated as total and second class citizens. Not good by any stretch of the imagination. Well, to make a bad situation worse, the Soviet Russians believe here the Ukrainians to be, in essence, inherently disloyal. And in 1925, in the aftermath of a power struggle following the unexpected death of the founder of the Soviet Union, Nikolai Lenin, Joseph Stalin, who's not a Russian, he's a Georgian from the Soviet Republic of Georgia, is going to emerge victorious. Joseph Stalin will go down in history as one of the two most evil human beings to ever grace planet Earth. The only other person who is in his league is Adolf Hitler. Historians go back and forth as to who is worse, okay? Stalin or Hitler, Hitler or Stalin. I would say here Hitler was worse, but Joseph Stalin technically killed more people than Adolf Hitler did. Well, what he is trying to do, what Stalin is trying to do here, is he is trying to transform this nation into being this industrial machine, quite frankly. And what he's taking is the Soviet Red Army. He's sending it off into the countryside here in the 1920s. And he's telling here these Ukrainian farmers, the kulaks, these slightly well-to-do farmers compared to most farmers in Ukraine, that I want all of your livestock. We're taking your livestock and you're getting nothing for it. We're moving you all on these collective farms. Well, as far as Ukraine is concerned, absolutely not. So what they do to protest this, because they know if they don't hand over their livestock, their horses, their cows, et cetera, that they're going to be executed. That's abundantly clear by the Red Army. So in order to protest this, what they do is they take their livestock out on the road and they slaughter them before the Soviet Army here arrives to take them. Well, you're playing hardball here with Joseph Stalin. He's not the most stable person in the planet, quite frankly, putting it mildly. And what he is going to then set up is forced collectivization. Forced collectivization will be the single most ghastly massacre in human history up to that time. He is going to single out the Ukrainians, and he is, in essence here, going to launch into an artificial famine. Now, there is no famine in Ukraine, but because you have this ultra-police state of the left wing, you have here, in essence, this Holodomor, as it's referred to as 
in Ukrainian society that is going to simply withhold food from the Soviet Republic. And the Ukrainians have, in the early stages, no idea what is going on, no idea whatsoever. Over the course of the next four years, more than four million Ukrainians are going to starve to death. Eventually, they realize that the Soviet government is behind this. Of these four million, of these four million who die, here's a photograph from 1932, 1.5 million of them are children. It's a horrible catastrophe across the board. Not only that, he is then going to take Joseph Stalin, he is then going to take countless millions more Ukrainians, as well as other so-called perceived enemies of the state, and shift, shift them off to, on the Trans-Siberian Railroad to these gulags across all of Siberia. You have here the deaths of tens of millions more, at least 10 million more here citizens are going to die. They'll be executed in the gulags, they'll be worked to death, they'll be starved to death there. It's this horrific crime right on across the board. He is going to rule here with this iron fist, rule with fear. Well, as far as Ukraine is concerned, they wanted nothing to do with the Soviet Union to begin with. Now you have this atrocity, this atrocity being launched here formally against you. And what the response would be is you have in the 1930s more and more of this movement of Ukrainian independence. It's difficult to do because you're in the midst here of this police state in Soviet Russia. You have Joseph Stalin, who is just unleashing this terrible wrath, though most residents of the Soviet Union have no idea that Comrade Stalin is completely behind it. He is. But he distances himself from it time and time again. And as the 1930s move on, Stalin is going to continue here going into these purges, where literally he is going to murder 80% of the Soviet Central Committee. He is going to, by the same end here, destroy 80% of the Red Army Officer Corps with these great show trials by 1938, which is very, very bad for the Soviet Union, especially as World War II is looming on the horizon. And you have this tremendous, tremendous catastrophe right on across the board for Ukraine. Well, as the 1930s progress, the Second World War is going to begin. World War II was thought to be this war to end all wars. Well, it proves here, in essence, to be a dress rehearsal for the Second World War, a war that would take the lives of 62 million people. We think, as human beings, we've come so far. Take into consideration the following. In the 20th century alone, more people died in warfare than died in all 5,000 years of recorded history before it combined. How far have we come? We haven't advanced much beyond Neanderthal, man, in terms of uh, basic compassion, human logic, if there can be such a thing. Well, World War II is going to forever change here the Soviet Union in a massive fashion. September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland. They're going to be the only Axis state. Immediately, Britain declares war along with France against Germany, and the war formally starts. Well, in rapid succession here, Poland is going to be knocked out by the German war machine in a matter of about three weeks. Poland had been out of existence, remember, controlled by Russia until it ceases to exist in 1796. It comes back in existence in 1919, following World War I, only to be out of existence again here, just a few weeks fighting in World War II. To the shock of the entire world on June 22, 1940, France falls, Britain stands alone. The United States is a neutral nation, starts pouring in Lend-Lease aid here across the board to keep the nation of Britain in. And what happens is one year to the day following the fall of France, Adolf Hitler, who is this ultra-right wing, this ultra-right wing autocrat, from Hitler's perspective here, he is going to look towards taking down a nation he despises the most, the Soviet Union. Any good Nazi or any good fascist is always going to hate a communist, and the opposite is also the case, all right, right on across the board. Well, what happens here in World War II is it is imperative to understand, because it plays implications up to and including the present day here with Russia and Ukraine. The Soviet Union as a nation is going to suffer more than any nation has ever suffered in, world, in all of world wars. Or, or any war for that matter. 
Take into consideration the following. Remember I said 62 million dead in World War II. Of the 62 million dead, 32 million are from the Allied side. So that would make up Britain, it would make up the United States, eventually following the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941. It would also make up here the Soviet Union, when Germany invades the Soviet Union here in the summer of 41. 32 million Allied dead in World War II. Of those 32 million Allied dead, the Soviet Union is going to lose just under 30 million people. Never before in the course of human history is a nation going to suffer like the Soviets suffer, and this is imperative because it really warps here post-World War II thinking. They suffered $364 billion, $364 billion of damage in World War II. John Kennedy in a speech in 1961 talked about the Soviet destruction in World War II at the hands of the Nazis, at the hands here of the Germans. And he stressed, think about the Mississippi River flowing down the middle of the United States. Now picture everything east of the Mississippi all the way to the east coast completely flattened. That's the level of destruction that the Soviet Union experienced here during the Second World War. Well, what happens, what happens is that the Soviets refer to this, or they see this, as the Great Patriotic War. As the Great Patriotic War, it was literally life or death. Because for Soviet POWs, for example, they are not going to be held in POW camps, as would be the case with British or American POWs by Germany and then released at the end of the war. Rather, they're going to be taken out and executed, or they're going to be sent here to uh, Auschwitz, to gas chambers here at Auschwitz and other killing centers located across of historic Poland to be done away with along with countless other undesirables, gypsies, homosexuals, Jehovah's Witnesses, right on across the board, as well as Jews. Well, what you have is this nation is going to, at the Battle of Stalingrad, who most historians consider to be the most significant battle of all in World War II, myself as, as well, is bigger than D-Day of June 6, 1944. In this titanic struggle between here the Soviet Red Army and Nazi Germany, it is a sense here, as far as the Soviets are concerned, of life or death, not just for the soldiers, but for the entire nation. Almost 90% of the dead in World War II are civilians. In this war, this is unbelievably horrific. Well, the Ukrainians and the Russians have mutual distrust of each other. As far as the Russians are concerned, they think the Ukrainians are, in fact, here in cahoots with the Nazis. That simply isn't true. But it's something here, this big lie that's repeated enough that many Russians, many Russians start to think that this, in fact, may be true. It may be the case. And all of this talk of communism, the glory of Marxist-Leninism, as far as Joseph Stalin and the Central Committee is concerned, forget that. It's a great patriotic war. It's life or death. This nation will pull itself together in what I would refer to as its finest hour. I'd also say World War II is the finest hour for Britain, taking that phrase from Winston Churchill. I would also say it is the finest hour for the United States. This corrosive evil, this right-wing extremist movement of Nazi Germany had to be defeated. And the Soviets here on the Eastern Front would certainly do their fair share. It was also the case as well with the United States and other allied nations, Britain included, coming from the West and bringing about the unconditional surrender here of Germany and the end of the war in Europe. But with the end of World War II, what we have here is the emergence of two superpowers. The Soviet Union, historically, and you have to understand this, has this tremendous fear of encirclement. Very, very much afraid of being encircled, very fearful of outsiders. And in World War I, Germany is able to defeat Russia. And it's humiliating, it's degrading. World War II, my god, the nation is utterly destroyed. We saw it was left to Stalingrad here by January of 1943. And the Soviet Union is going to emerge psychologically greatly damaged by this experience of the Second World War. And it will be, nevertheless, a military superpower. 
The United States, by comparison, in 1945, is the only nation, the only nation to emerge from World War II virtually unscathed. The United States will lose 410,000 lives in World War II, if you include the Pacific Theater with the European Theater. It will pay here a very heavy price, no doubt about it, but take into consideration the following. In 1945, the United States represents 6% of the world's population. It controls 63% of the world's industry and 75% of the world's capital. Never before in human history would a nation be in such a great prominence as the U.S. was in in 1945. The domination really began in 1915. Despite the Great Depression, the U.S. would still emerge here as this extraordinary power. Not only is it an economic power, it is also a military superpower. The Soviets cannot compete with the United States economically. The Soviet Union never even cracks the top 20 nations in the world from an economic perspective. This is true all the way into the 1960s, 1970s. You've got Italy, you've got West Germany, you've got Britain, you've got France running circles around this nation. And the nation is a population that's nearly three times as great as the West European power. Well, these two had been allies, the United States and the Soviet Union, but Henry Luce of Time Magazine in 1945 talks about here the 19th century had been the British century, the 20th century would be the American century. Henry Lewis is correct. The French refer to the United States as this hyperpower. It's in a league all its own. Well, what happens here is you have this falling out between these two World War II allies. In fairness, it was a strange bed partnership anyway between the Americans and the Soviets in World War II. They had the common enemy, Germany, but they didn't have a great deal of trust towards each other, and understandably so. But we end up here with this bipolar world a U.S. camp and a Soviet camp. This U.S. camp and a Soviet camp. And Milwaukee's own, my hometown, George Kennan. George Kennan, who's a member of Harry Truman's administration, stresses here as we have this bipolar world formally set up. You can see the nations in orange. They would all be loyal to the Soviet Union. Here's Ukraine, dragged in, kicking, screaming here into the Soviet Union, along with other Soviet republics all tied, the dominant republic being Russia. But you will have this bipolar world, in essence here, these orange states, as the Soviets are going to reach out for security reasons, they're going to take control of all of these East European nations. Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, at least initially, Albania, as well as communist East Germany. These are all going to be Soviet satellite states, setting up, in essence, this buffer zone. This is done out of paranoia on the basis here of being invaded yet again. They suffered in World War I, the nation of Russia, the Soviet Union suffers to unbelievable levels in World War II. What happens here is the United States is going to go off and set up military alliances here of its own. Because the Americans, whether you're talking Harry Truman or Dwight Eisenhower, they're very concerned that what the Soviets are going to try to do is start moving into Central Europe and Western Europe. There's a very prominent military. Economically, they're a mess. There's no doubt about that. But the military here and the military strength of this new superpower is indeed quite striking. Well, as time goes on, you have this struggle between these two nations, the Cold War, as it's referred to as. And what George Kennan stressed, going back to Harry Truman's administration in 1947, is that what the Soviets are most afraid of is being encircled being encircled. It's going to freak them out, being locked in. So let them have these nations in Eastern Europe, Poland, Hungary, whatever. But what we need to do now is take the United States and completely surround the Soviets. Not an inch. Anywhere here around the globe, they're going to push into the United States has to push back. Harry Truman's Truman Doctrine. The United States will defend any nation anywhere in the world that is opposed to communism. Well, George Kennan argued he argued that what's going to happen here is that eventually the Soviet Union is going to fall apart from within. It's this illegitimate, this bastard state that really, quite frankly, has no chance of survival long term. It's going to fall apart from within. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. So don't try and take territory that they already control. Let them have it, but don't let them have anything else. 
This policy of containment, 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 containment will be a policy that will be followed by future presidents, whether it's Democrat Harry Truman or Republican Dwight Eisenhower and onwards. George Cannon lives to be 101, 101 years old. And he also lived to see the falling apart of the Soviet Union, okay? watching here history unfold just as he predicted it. Well, the Cold War really between the United States and the Soviets, despite the grandstanding and the posturing of the late 1970s and, and Ronald Reagan and the evil empire, so on and so forth, it's really done by 1972. Richard Nixon, President of the United States, Republican from California, and Leonid Brezhnev are going to sign here the SALT I Agreement, or Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. And what this does is it brings about a thaw in the Cold War. By 1960, the United States and the Soviet Union had enough in their respective nuclear arsenals to blow up every inch of the planet six times over. <laughs> Dwight Eisenhower, the pride of Abilene, Kansas, said, how many times can you kill the same man? Oh, good question. Good question. Well, you have the SALT I in 1972, 50 years ago. You have here with SALT I the start, the beginning here of the formal end. It's a permanent lessening of tension with the French referred to as detente, detente. Well, what happens here is in the 1980s, the Soviet Union is a mess. It's a mess. You have all of these unhappy Soviet republics who are sick and tired of the Russians having the upper hand, sick and tired of them treating them as second-class citizens, and this is especially the case with Ukraine. This old Soviet-style command economy, Marxism, has failed, and failed miserably. To quote here Winston Churchill, conservative prime minister, Britain in World War II, I am opposed to democracy, Churchill said, but the alternatives are much, much worse. I agree. I agree 100%. The 20th century shows, shows that. Well, in 1985, the Soviet Union has a new General Secretary, Mikhail Gorbachev, and Gorbachev is engaged here in this war in Afghanistan, and by the same end, he is instituting reforms. There's a saying in history, and the saying is as follows, the most dangerous time for a bad government is not when a bad government remains bad, but when a bad government begins to reform for the good. In other words, if you're corrupt as hell, stay corrupt as hell. It's safer. It's a lot safer. Well, you've got Gorbachev here in the late 1980s, and what he's trying to do is he's trying to make the Soviet Union transition into catching up to the Western nations. This is his goal, his focus, his objective. So he institutes first and foremost Perestroika. Now, Perestroika is the Soviet plan for the economy, which means shifting from this command economy to a capitalist economy comparable to that of the United States, comparable to that of the West European nations, comparable to that of Japan, so on and so forth. The second policy is glasnost, which is foreign policy. Literally means here openness, openness. What he has done is he's gone over and he's opened the window to reform. The problem here is that you are a leader of a bad government. And you're beginning to reform for the good. And if we remember Tim's lessons, he said, that happens, my God, not only is the window going to get knocked in, the whole wall can come caving down on you. And this is exactly what happens. Exactly here what happens. And you see, first and foremost, it's not the Soviet republics who are looking to leave. It's going to be, first and foremost, the nations of Eastern Europe that have been dragged overwhelmingly, in fairness to them, kicking and screaming into the Soviet empire here after World War II. And we see, in essence, the events of 1989, remember Lech Walesa and Solidarity? Because in the Soviet satellite states in Eastern Europe, non-communist parties could not participate in elections. It had been tried in 56 with Imranaji in Hungary, failed miserably. It had tried with Alexander Dubček in Czechoslovakia in 1968, failed miserably. Now, Lech Walesa, from Gdansk, Poland, is going to try this with his Solidarity Movement. Well, in May of 1989, Solidarity wins. And now you have a non-communist party controlling this one-time communist state, Poland. What does Gorbachev do? Nothing. He allows for it to happen. 
think back to 1989, the most significant year without a doubt of the entire 20th century, even bigger than 1945. Suddenly here, like dominoes, the domino theory in reverse as far as the capital states would be concerned. What you have here is the Berlin Wall comes crashing down. You have all of these changes. In some cases, the communist governments, the satellite states are overthrown. They're overthrown here in vicious revolutions, as is the case with Romania and Nikolai Ceausescu. Other cases, it's more of a peaceful transition transformation. It opens the door as well for the reunification of Germany from East Germany and West Germany here by 1991. Well, when the Soviet republics see this going down, as far as they're concerned, here's their opportunity. Here is their opportunity, once and for all, to break free. And the Baltic republics who hated the Soviet regime with a passion, which now looks like it's crumbling anyway, the Baltic republics of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, they're going to be the first three. It will also be Ukraine after all this time, going all the way back to Imperial Russia, that Ukraine will proclaim its independence as well. You have these hands across Ukraine. You're going to have tens of thousands of Ukrainians holding hands in a show of solidarity and support here in 1991. Well, for Gorbachev, he's lost control of the entire situation. <laughs> His popularity isn't exactly skyrocketing here back in the Kremlin in Moscow, not by any means. But as far as he was concerned, it was long overdue anyway. We needed a change. Change had to come about. Well, what takes place here, what takes place is the Soviet Union is going to be broken apart at the seams. And the largest of all the Soviet republics, Russia, wants to hold on to it, wants to hold it all together right across the board. They've lost Estonia, they've lost Latvia, they've lost Lithuania. The Chechnyans are looking to go their own separate ways. The Ukrainians, ah, we couldn't trust them anyway. They're going to do their own thing as well. And you have here suddenly Russia, the second-rate power. In fairness, and this is imperative to understand, economically, Russia was never a world power. Not even close. It's remained backward up to and including the present day. First time I was there with a group of UW students, I was like, oh my god, this is the big bad Soviet Union? Holy mackerel, this place is a dump. It's a case the average Soviet citizen waited in line three hours a day. Three hours a day. If I'm at Target and I've got to wait 10 minutes, I don't have anything else going on, I start getting <laughs> bent out of shape. Well, god, I've, got, I've got places to go. I've got to get home. Well, you have here the image versus the reality were two different things, two completely different things. The Russians are wonderful as students stayed with families in Leningrad over the course of four days, really got to know families fairly well and the culture, etc. In Ukraine as well, the people were wonderful. Three different trips, all very, very good. But you have here a nation that now has lost its direction. Russia's a centerpiece. <coughs> but it's breaking apart the seams. And many, many, many Russians look back, Soviets look back to the good old days, to the good old days, to when we were this world power. And the United States was our big rival. Well, you have this sense of living in the past. And we see the past oftentimes as human beings through these rose-colored glasses. My parents, who were both raised in the Great Depression, my father was a World War II veteran, they would tell stories as a kid growing up in Milwaukee, and you wouldn't think the Great Depression was all that bad, but I know both their families suffered tremendously during that time period in New London, no doubt about that. And my dad saw some really horrific things in the European theater in World War II. But it's a sense here of looking back, it really kind of romanticized this time period for me as a kid growing up. Well, what we have is Vladimir Putin. Vladimir Putin was born in Leningrad in 1952. He was one of three boys, born into more of a middle class family. And what he would do is he would join here the Communist Party. He would also here join the KGB. The KGB, the KGB is the equivalent uh, of the American CIA. All nations spy on each other. That's just the way it goes. The bottom line is you don't want to get caught. Well, he's in the KGB for 16 years, stationed for some time here in East Germany, other times in New Zealand. 
His front is that he's a shoe salesman. Well, what happens is that in 1991, when Russia here, in fact, formally falls apart, Mikhail Gor Gorbachev is going to retire, and this nation of Russia is now independent, he leaves the KGB, he's not happy, he leaves in disgust. And he's going to enter politics here in his home city of Leningrad, where he will have a fair amount of success as a local politician. But what's going to really help him is when Gorbachev steps down, Boris Yeltsin will be the first president here of this new Russian Federation. And Putin is going to get in close with Boris Yeltsin. He'll get in close here with Boris Yeltsin. It will help a great deal in terms of his political career. Well, for, for Boris Yeltsin, I should say rather, for Vladimir Putin, you have this individual who will become a part of Yeltsin's cabinet. He's also here going to oversee the secret police because this is his background of what it had been in the time period of the KGB where he had the most amount of experience. He's appointed here the head of the FSB, which is basically the new KGB for this nation of Russia. And Putin becomes his very public image over the course of the 1990s. Law and order. Law and order. We're going to crack down on corruption across this nation of Russia. Here's what's imperative to understand. Communism crumbles. It crumbles across Eastern Europe. But now the pendulum is going to swing to the other side, to the extreme right. The extreme right wing is as bad, I would say worse, than communism historically. Far more violent, <laughs> causes far more problems, far more expansionist, far more intolerant, etc. So here, across Eastern Europe, these nations have their hands full because everything that's communist is bad on the left, so let's go to the other extreme. And you have large-scale corruption as these nations are trying to find their way. This is true in Russia. This is true in Ukraine. This is true across all of these Soviet satellite states in Eastern Europe. It's a struggle. It's a struggle here to find a way. Well. What's making things more of a challenge for the former Soviets is the fact that the United States emerges here as the world's predominant power. There's nobody even to compete with the United States. The Soviets couldn't compete economically. They could only compete militarily. And certainly the infrastructure is still there. But the Americans here back up the European Union. And it appears as though this European Union, which was established in 1957, is now starting to go after Soviet satellite states in Eastern Europe, now starting to potentially go after Soviet, former Soviet republics. This is a concern. The other concern is the United States had established this military alliance, NATO, in the Cold War in 1949, this North Atlantic Treaty Organization that brought about collective security that stressed here that if any Soviet satellite state or the Soviet Union itself attacked a NATO state, it would be viewed as an attack on all states. It would be like attacking the United States if you attack here Austria and it's part of NATO. Well, Russia is lost. It's lost and it's living here under Putin in this highly theatrical past that simply was not reality. I would go so far as to say this nation never recovered from World War II. To give you an idea, with $364 billion of damage and the loss of 30 million lives, it never really recovered. But now, as time moves on, you have this right-wing autocracy formally in power, formally here in power in historic Russia. And the net result, the net result is that there will be a movement for a new Russia, a new outlook, to, in essence, blow the whistle on the government. In the past, the communist government got away with murder, literally. Nobody dared to stand up to the communist government. Now you have this right-wing autocracy in Russia, and what Putin is going to do, basically here, he is going to become the de facto president at the start of the 21st century as Boris Yeltsin is going to be forced to resign on corruption charges. 
And what he will do, what he's going to do is set off trying to curb this problem of severe poverty, of hunger, quite frankly, in this nation. A nation that is shockingly poor, especially compared to any other modern state across the globe. So you have this movement going on. It's going to make him popular with the Russian people. By the same end, he has to deal with the Russian oligarchs. Corruption here was widespread. It's widespread across all of Eastern Europe. The black market was flourishing. I can remember buying tickets for my students to go to the Bolshoi in Moscow. They didn't want rubles at this time. They only wanted American dollars. And I'm getting the back seat of this black sedan, and I'm like, I'm dead. I had my money in my socks, like, I don't know if that was going to help or anything. <laughs> but I got some good cheap tickets, but it was clearly bought on the black market. Same with the Moscow Circus. So it was in essence here, this is the way it was. We'd have to bribe the man with the big babushka, because they'd put our luggage on the train, otherwise they're going to mess with the student's luggage, mess with my luggage too. But just the way it was, you give them $20 US, everything's cool. Okay? If you don't, there's going to be some problems, Igor would tell you. Well, here, the oligarchs are unbelievably wealthy. And they're leery of Putin and this program here to help the poor, to help curb poverty. Well, he cuts a deal with them. He cuts a deal with them here that they will support him, and he will also give them a voice, give them here a strong voice. What the Russian autocracy is going to stress time and time again here with its new president, Vladimir Putin, talking about the enemies of the state. And in particular, you have Russian journalists who are talking about crimes committed by the Russian army in places like Chechnya. Chechnya wanted its independence here free of Russian control. When he was working for uh, Boris Yeltsin, Putin oversaw the first major crackdown on Chechnya. Now he is going to crack down on Chechnya a second time. Well, you have this Anna Politkovskaya who is going to, she is this journalist, who is going to start speaking out about these crimes that were committed against Chechnyan civilians and the corruption within the Russian army itself. It's front page news. She's a very, very popular journalist here in 2006. Well, what happens? After five weeks of her reporting, she is shot dead in her apartment lobby here on Vladimir Putin's birthday. Surprise, surprise. Another 82 journalists have been murdered from 2006 onwards. Not only that, political opposition, they also mysteriously die. They're usually poisoned. Or they disappear, etc. Right on across the board. And the problem, the problem is that you've gone from this left-wing extreme to now the right-wing extreme. A murder of perceived opponents. It's almost like Stalinist Russia, but I wouldn't say that Putin has the same level of paranoia as Joseph Stalin had. Well, what the concern here, the major concern is across the board, is Ukraine. Ukraine. The Soviet republics have basically formally all broken up, for the most part except those that are very, very weak and are tied here to the centerpiece of the Russian Federation. Petro Poroshenko in Ukraine, he's president of Ukraine from 2014 to 2019. What he was looking for was to bring Ukraine into the European Solidarity Party. The European Solidarity Party. In other words, for protection, for protection, Ukraine wants itself tied to the strong nations of Western Europe protection economically. Because if you have these smaller, weaker nations in Western Europe, a classic example would be Portugal. Another example, Ireland. What the Germans, the French especially did, the British to a lesser extent, poured here a great deal of economic aid and really helped these nations to improve. Standard of living right across the board. Amazing, quite frankly. Well, the East European nations see this. And the East European nations would love to be part of the EU, if at all possible. This is what Petro Poroshenko is after. But the concerns here is that Russia is going to rule this area with an iron fist, and they're not going to let them take one step. <clears throat> By the same end, Ukraine is having all sorts of economic problems, economic shortcomings. And to tie into all of this, 
You've got large-scale corruption across Ukraine. You have it in Russia, you have it in Ukraine, you have it in Moldova, you have it as well, I would say, in, uh, uh, when you get into nations to some extent, at least in terms of the Baltic Republics, Belarus, which is still a hardline communist state, former Soviet Republic, tremendous corruption there. And what's happening here as the Russians become all the more leery is that not just the European Union, these West European nations started in 1957 by West Germany and France in particular. Eventually, Italy, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and Belgium would all join. They would have this mutual cooperation, tying their economies together for coal, steel, etc. And as the 20th century continued, they would be joined here by other nations. Well, Western Europe is this force economically. It is a force economically. But following the events of 1989, the East European nations all wanted in as well. They're free of Soviet control. You're much better off being tied to Western Europe than tied to the former Russians, that is for sure, no doubt about it. So Poland, Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, Romania, Croatia, Slovenia are all going to join here the EU or the European Union, tying here their economies together. This is another blow to Russia. Then, then the Soviet republics follow suit. The Soviet republics here also follow suit across the board. Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia. By 1993, the EU had expanded to 27 nations. And the European Union is also closely allied with the big, strong power, the United States. The hyperpower, as the French would refer to it as. And France and the United States are very, very close allies. So you have this grave concern on the part of the Russians. But it gets worse for the Russians. NATO. NATO. Formally established by the United States, a sense of collective security against the Soviet Union. The original members of NATO were Britain, Norway, Belgium, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Portugal, Italy, West Germany, Denmark, Canada, Greece, Turkey, and the United States. Well, in 1990, in 1990, the East European nations are going to apply for membership. They're going to apply for membership here to NATO. It takes some years. But Poland is going to be joining in that decade, as well as Slovenia, Slovakia, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Bulgaria, uh, Romania, and Hungary. So you have East European nations joining the American military alliance. You have, by the same token, former Soviet republics joining the American alliance. This is not good. Not good in any way, shape, or form as far as the Russians are concerned. They still have this grandiose vision of having really been something. But it's cracking here. It's falling apart across the board as they speak. Well, as far as Putin is concerned, you got to put an end to it. You have to put an end to it once and for all. And he's really worried about Ukraine. Because what Ukraine did, what Ukraine did in 2017, is they applied for membership to the EU to the EU. Now, technically, what they go in as is the DCFTA, which is the Deep and Comprehensive Free Trade Areas. It's a way for Ukraine to get its foot in the door, reaching out to the West European nations and to former Soviet bloc nations, creating here a stronger and stronger alliance. By the same end, by the same end, the Ukrainians are looking for membership into NATO because they don't trust the Russians. They don't trust the Russians in any way, shape, or form, now, sh nor should they. In 2014, Russia's going to take Crimea, Russia's going to take the Donbass region, and now Vladimir Putin is openly threatening the Ukrainians. And he's openly threatening the Ukrainians using a key word, a dog whistle, so to speak, that all the Russians are going to know, and that is Nazis. They're Nazis. They're Nazis. And we're going to clean, you, cleanse Ukraine of Nazis. Second of all, you also have here in Ukraine, you also have here in Ukraine, a government that is treating the Russian people unfairly. Unfairly. 
83% of the population of Ukraine are Ukrainians. 17% are Russians. They live overwhelmingly in the Crimea as well as the Donbass region. They are not being treated unfairly. It's the same line Adolf Hitler used regarding the poor Germans in the Sudetenland in September of 1938 at the time of the Munich crisis. The big lie. Well, in 2019, Petro Poroshenko knows he's walking a bit of a tightrope. Most of the Ukrainian people aren't too concerned about Russia. They're more worried about the economy and more worried about corruption here in Ukraine. Well, it's going to be in 2019 that Vladimir Zelensky is going to run. He is going to run here for the presidency. Now, Zelensky, Zelensky was born in 1978. He's a Ukrainian. He's, he's Jewish. Born in Krivi Riha, a fairly small town here in Ukraine. And he go on in school, he earned a law degree, uh, but he really wasn't interested in practicing law. Uh, what he was more interested in is a career in acting, uh, especially stand-up comedy. He's a very, very funny guy. He's kind of like, by the easiest way of referring to Zelensky, he's kind of like the Jerry Seinfeld of Ukraine. Okay? <laughs> well, he gains national recognition because he becomes this TV star on this wildly popular Seinfeld equivalent, okay? servant of the people in Ukraine. Okay? He's a very, very funny guy to begin with, and the, the show is in many ways, in many ways there's not really all that great of a plot to it, with the exception, with the exception here that he is playing the role of president of Ukraine. So by God, if you played the role of president of Ukraine, from the palace in Kiev, you sure as heck are going to be a great, great president. You know that. Well, in 2019, he's going to run against Petro Poroshenko. And he campaigned here as an outsider, campaigns anti-establishment. He's also anti-corruption, anti-corruption. And what will happen is he won in April of 2019 73% of the popular vote. Well, he was very effective in terms of social media and getting his, his voice out there, getting to be heard. And what happens is he is trying, in essence, first and foremost, to create, to create here a Ukraine that would embrace all peoples. He'd stress to the Ukrainians, we know what it was like to be treated second class. We suffered for generations at the hands of the Soviets, and before that at the hands of the Russians. We have Russians living amongst us here who are good people. They need to be embraced. They need to be treated here with dignity and respect. Don't do to them what the Russians did to us. He wants to create here a much larger net, if that was at all, in fact, formally possible. Second of all, he would also ask Putin if he could sit down and talk with him. Well, in December of 2019, December of 2019, Putin and Zelensky would sit down for some negotiations, mostly because, of course, Ukraine's Crimea is gone, the Donbass region is gone, and there's these separatist movements or these cross-border raids that are going on, constant skirmishes. It have been happening since 2014. We need a ceasefire. We have to have some way of bringing this to an end. The talks would be mediated by the two big European powers, Germany and France, which is key. Okay? Because the Ukrainians and the Russians are going to have a hard time getting through about five minutes with each other, much less negotiating any sort of long-term ceasefire. Well, in December of 2019, they negotiated a ceasefire. But by the standpoint of July, not only had that ceasefire been broken, it had been the 20th ceasefire that had been broken in just a little over seven months. What Zelensky really wants is he wants to get Ukraine in the EU. He wants Ukraine desperately in the EU. And as a follow-up to that, he's all over the United States because he wants Ukraine in NATO. It's the ultimate insurance policy. All of the East European nations, they're all joining NATO. Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, they're all in NATO. Sweden, they're thinking about it. Finland, well, they're getting pretty close to being on board too. All with this historic fear of the Russians, right on across the board. Well, what happens, what happens is he will visit the United States, he'll meet with Joe Biden, Met with Apple CEO Tim Cook, spoke at Stanford, 
And he stresses here to the U.S. government that what Ukraine really needs is protection and the protection of NATO. Well, Putin knows what's going on. He also sends word that if NATO, NATO expands its military infrastructure in Ukraine, it would, quote, cross red lines, end quote. The U.S. government accuses here Putin of preparing for a massive invasion against Russia. Putin denies it. It's not happening. Well, American intelligence is all over this, and they can figure out exactly how many forces are coming, where they're going, etc., and they let Zelensky know right on across the board. It's coming, and it's going to happen in February of 2022, guaranteed. In December of 2021, 11 months ago, a poll taken in Russia, the Levada Center poll, found here that 50% of the Russian population blamed NATO and the United States for this impending crisis between Russia and Ukraine. 16% blamed the Ukrainians, 4% blamed Russia. On February 21st, 2022, Putin recognized two separatist republics in Ukraine in the Donbass region here in the eastern part. And then he spoke of, here on the 21st of February this year, then he spoke of the historic mistakes that were made in 1991 when the Soviet Union granted sovereignty to other Soviet republics on historically Russian land. There is a claim. Right? He also added to this that Russia, I'm sorry, that Ukraine was being turned into an anti-Russia by the imperial West. And Russia's not going to stand for this anymore. We need here a special military operation to get rid of the Nazis, to get rid of this Zelensky, the lead Nazi, who's actually Jewish. And it's like, the, of course he knows that. It's a total jab at him. <laughs> because it's imperative for us to protect the Donbass region. Well, on February 22nd, the assault is launched. Now, what was frustrating for the U.S. and the West European nations is they were telling Zelensky, listen, you're going to get hit in a massive fashion. It's coming. Not a question of if here formally. It's a question of when. And what the Russians were looking to do is they're going to go right, right to the heart of the matter, Kiev, mm -hmm. and take down here Kiev, and the rest of it is all going to fall into place. Take into consideration the following fact. The Russian army is eight times the size of the Ukrainian army. Yes, eight times the size. So in other words, if my masculines are correct, for every eight Russian soldiers you have, you've got one Ukrainian. And the Russians are pushed back at each and every front. At each and every front. Putin, first and foremost, never expected this. Never expected the level of ferocity that the Ukrainians would, in fact, here retaliate against the Russians using everything and anything to stave off this disaster, the complete destruction of their nation. Second of all, the international community is going to step in in a huge way. West Europe, the nation who is playing the most prominent role of all behind the scenes, the United States. Because it's a sense here that Russia, quite frankly, is a nation on the way out. It is. It is. Russia is a second-rate nation. The rivalry for the United States in the future, it's China. It's not Russia. The United Nations here is going to condemn this Russian attack on Ukraine. 141 nations condemned it. Five supported it. China abstained. I guarantee you why China abstained, because China, to be worried, the United States is going to be getting too powerful. It's going to impact Chinese areas of influence. India is also going to abstain. Well, the war here, this war, to take down both Kyiv as well as the rest of Ukraine, failed and failed miserably. In the early days of the war, the United States sent word to Vladimir Zelensky saying that we can get you out of there because they're coming after you. You're in a bunker right now. This isn't safe. We can escort you out to safer havens. You can still here, in fact, formally conduct the war. Zelensky fired back, I'm not going anywhere. I'm staying right here. I need ammunition, not a ride. That became the claim for the Ukrainian people across the board. I need ammunition, not a ride. And with the international community support and NATO military support, as well as US aid, it helped Ukraine a tremendous level. 
and Russia in this first full assault failed, and failed miserably, and had to withdraw. The one big point this past summer in August was it was going to be the retaliation coming back, a counteroffensive launched by Ukraine, to push back on these areas that Russia had gained in Ukraine. If this counteroffensive worked, whole new ballgame for Ukraine. The counteroffensive is launched in August, it worked. The next big step is that if Putin had no choice but to go so far as to implement the draft in Russia, it's all fine and dandy as long as you don't have to fight in this war. And the war is in Ukraine, it's not in Russia. He knew this would be incredibly unpopular, but he's painted himself into a bit of a corner. And what you have going on here at present is mass graves are being discovered, which happens in war all the time. Atrocities are very, very common. And the net result is that these two nations, these two nations are setting the stage for a long, drawn-out grudge match. No doubt about it. What the future is, quite frankly, is anyone's guess. Russia has the upper hand. Russia also has here tactical nuclear weapons that it could use. But in the present day, if you play that card, for this nation of Russia that is being demonized, and understandably so, on the international scene to the stage that it is, it's not going to help matters, not by any means. There's a tremendous amount of pressure here to turn the tide against this nation of Ukraine. The Ukrainians are standing strong because of Western support, But even without Western support, the fact of the matter is they deserve the bulk of the credit for trying desperately to hold on to their independence. I'm oftentimes asked, how do I think it's going to end? Well, as I said, I think in Wapaka four years ago when I was back from Pennsylvania, and I was predicting, I said the stage, and I was predicting the Palestinians and the Israelis would have it all together. <laughs> Ten years ago, you heard it first from Tim Crane. It's going to happen in the next two years. I know it. I feel it in my bones. <laughs> well, that didn't happen. And I can guarantee you, I can guarantee you, long after our earthly journeys have all come to an end, the Palestinians and the Israelis are still going to be going at it. And they will get it resolved at some point or another. And then in the words of Roseanne, Rosanna Dana, also known as Gilda Radner, in life, it's always something. If it isn't one thing, it's another. So trying to actually predict what's going to happen here, that becomes the major challenge. What I would say most likely the scenario is, Zelensky has said that he does not want this war to go into next year. He said that back in July. I think it's inevitably going to. Uh, Henry Kissinger, who's going to be 100 years old next year, he said to Zelensky, he sent words saying that, you know, you should just negotiate. Negotiate, cut your losses, move forward. Zelensky said absolutely not. What the Ukrainians want is not just the Donbass region, they also want the Crimean from 2014, mm -hmm. which further complicates matters. Mm -hmm. right? It makes here a very, very difficult situation. But you have to see things here from the standpoint of Ukraine as this independent nation fighting for its survival, and also Russia a nation by the same token that is very much surrounded, as far as it's concerned, by these hostile nations. And the big bad Soviet Union, more myth, I would say, than real, has crumbled apart completely, and you're trying desperately to hold on to whatever you have left. Time will tell. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any questions at all? There's some time. Yes, ma'am. I heard that, um, what's his name, Putin has cancer. Yeah, there were, there were reports that his health wasn't good, uh, um, and it's, it, I, I, I'd say that probably is not the case. He seems to be doing okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a possibility, but uh, with, it, I mean, it almost goes back, with the, the problem with information coming from uh, Russia, or even the former Soviet Union, is still very much this enclosed police, de police state mindset across the board. So up is down, down is up, etc. Uh, for example, you, you'd fly into in, uh, you'd fly into Russia in the 1990s, and you'd fly the it went in three times on, on Aeroflot, 
and the, the, the air flot pilots once you cross the border into the Soviet Union, it was like you were, you know, it was like kamikaze missions. The planes would be going all over because what the Soviets had done is they uh, uh, they had forged in essence maps to confuse here uh, the Germans to confuse as well here other nations that might plan an invasion of the Soviet Union. So the pilots and the airplanes, the national airlines, Aeroflot, didn't want people to be able to see the ground, to be able to, you know, it's the ultimate in paranoia, quite frankly. <laughs> but it's kind of like the way things, in fact, were. So a lot of information, the problem, though, in the present day is with the information superhighway, it's a lot easier, even in a police state sort of mindset, to get information from the outside as to what's really going on. So I think he's, I think he's okay uh, uh, for now. But you never know what's going on behind the scenes. The patience of the oligarchs, it's not going well. This is a big, bad Russian army, and it's looking about as prominent so far as Rebecca of Donnybrook Farm. <laughs> yes, and she's not powerful. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, what do you oh, anticipate could be the impact if the United States military assistance is reduced substantially? I think that if, if U.S. military assistance is reduced substantially, uh, I think it will have a very detrimental effect uh, on, the, on the Ukrainians uh, and their efforts against the Russians. And that's why I think Putin is pushing this, that it's all the Americans and their West European <coughs> allies who are, in fact, formally behind this. Uh, I applaud the United States for standing up with the Ukrainians 100%. Um, it's, it's, in essence here, uh, the right thing to do. It's the morally correct thing to do. And the, the problem is that there's that you're walking a bit of a tightrope. Uh, you're walking in a bit of a minefield. Mm -hmm. And just like the Soviets and the Americans during the Cold War, in fairness, they steered clear of each other. There were lines that did not cross. They'd steer clear of each other, and that was a wise thing. Uh, I'd say probably in large measure had to do with the fact of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, nuclear weapons probably saved us from World War III. In the words of Albert Einstein, I don't know how World War, he was asked how World War III would be fought. He said, I don't know, but I know how World War IV will be fought. It'll be fought with sticks and stones because it's all that's going to be left. <laughs> I would agree with him. So it's, it's tough. I think U.S. aid, West European aid is utterly essential. And, and it's a block, the Americans and the West Europeans, and a very, very strong block. Uh, just like a very strong uh, relationship the United States has with Japan, too. Uh, forged here in the aftermath of World War II. Yes, sir. Has, has uh, uh, Bill Browder's, Browder's knowledge has had any negative, negative effect on the uh, uh, Russian economy? economy? Okay, describe with Bill Crowder what his knowledge is in terms of... Oh, uh, uh, I, I thought, thought you might know. know. He's been... been uh, uh, he was really, really influential, influential in... Uh, 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 as, as the Soviet Union fell, fell he... Uh, ended up uh, uh, kind of make, uh, ra raising a lot of havoc with, with their stock market and, 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 and the ownership of a variety of their things. things. Did he think that it was going to be something positive? I mean, what, what Russians did, which was why? No, he, no, he was, was making, making money. money. Okay, okay. So, so they did a lot of international. Uh, uh, Finland came in in a big way. So too did Sweden to really help because the Finns and the Swedes, they pretty much have it going on. You know, they're uh, super advanced uh, uh, economically, small nations, but they, they set up a lot of international ventures uh, to really help modernize the nation of Russia. And a good deal of progress in fairness has been made. There's no doubt about that. Uh, but I would say, in fairness, it's difficult. <coughs> we had that theme from out of the gate tonight of 100 years behind. Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, catch up, catch up, window to the west. Imperial Russia falls by the wayside. The Soviet Union's got to catch up. World War II, it never happens. Soviet Union falls apart. Now Russia's kind of like still trying to find its way forward. So it's always been that, that titanic struggle. Uh, and now you have the breaking up of the former Soviet republics who really want nothing to do with the Russians. They see them as bullies, as thugs. And it complicates matters uh, more so, especially when you have the former Soviet republics reaching out economically to Western Europe, and then reaching out as well in terms of mili military alliances. Uh, Finland, for example, uh, and Sweden, they've, they've applied for membership to NATO. And they're, they're both going to be accepted by NATO. They're worried about Russia as well. But it's imperative to understand Russia is a second-rate power. It is, not, it is not the power that it was. It's a, it's a, po a power that's fading, in fact. I'd say it's going from second-rate almost into a third-rate category in a very, very rapid fashion. 
That should not be a major concern for the United States, not to cloud matters here. Because what the US knows, quite frankly, is that China, there's always a case a lot of the Chinese get their acts together. Mm -hmm. They were saying that long before Mao Zedong, for example, in 1949. China's got its act together. It's a communist government with the capital of Takana, and it can compete, and is competing, well with the United States. So you have these two massive economies, big drop off, and it's Western Europe. But the US is closely tied with Western Europe as well. That's going to be more of an issue for the, from an American perspective in the future. But the Americans are also doing what they see as the right thing, supporting uh, the Ukrainians, which I would agree is correct. Yes, sir. I think this is true. I, I thought that Ukraine once had nuclear weapons, and they gave them up in return for security guarantees from Europe or somebody. It, it's, a, it's a possibility that the, the, there were, uh, during the Soviet era, that there were missile sites there. Uh, I'm not sure in terms of the transition in the post-Soviet era with the, with the breakup of the Soviet Union. The Soviets try and set up the CIS, the Commonwealth of Independent States, which is Belarus, uh, Ukraine, and Russia. And the Belarusians and the uh, uh, Ukrainians want nothing to do with it. So it's pretty much, it, it falls by the wayside. So there may have been nuclear weapons there. I mean, the, uh, if you remember the time of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the and the, now oh God. and the library will be closing. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, I, Dan, I remember this happened last time. No more talk from Ukraine, library's closed. <laughs> Making all sorts of friends here in Walpack. I'll have the we, head we librarian have down to here stay in late. So, oh, we can stay late. Have questions? Okay. We do have permission to stay late. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. Last time, it, last time it was eight o'clock, not eight o'clock. Would Would you speak on the impact of the Russian men who are so swiftly leaving Russia and what that has to do with the war effort? Exactly. Uh, in fact, it's gotten to the stage with Russia that they are they are also here uh, uh, prisoners in Russian jails are being drafted into the army. Okay? So you get out a jail free card if you go into the army. The problem here, or the reports are, uh, coming from international news, uh, how biased or not, it's difficult to say, but they're, they're poorly supplied, they're poorly fed. Most significant of all, they're poorly trained. And if you look at the counteroffensive that was launched, and again, this is military experts, God knows I'm not, I'm a historian guy. Uh, Military experts were saying for the, the counteroffensive that was launched by Ukrainians uh, uh, in August and into early September of this year, the pushback, and it was like this massive uh, retreat on the part of the Russians, that that just shows just a tremendous lack of training here uh, on the part of the Russian army. So this isn't, or so it seems, this isn't the Soviet army of the Cold War, which was in fact incredibly prominent and very, very powerful and tremendously well-trained. I mean, World War II, unbelievably so. Uh, not just Russia, not just Soviet men, but Soviet women as well in the front ranks. So it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's a challenging aspect of it, basically. Other questions? I just have a question about uh, the infrastructure now is being um, bombed by the Russians. Mm -hmm. And do you see that having a, a pretty big impact on where the the war is headed as well. Excellent question. Yeah, it's, it's a case that I would say the, the attack on the infrastructure is huge. If you go back in the American persona to Operation Desert Storm um, in, in February of 1991, the focus, especially during the, the first assault from the air, it was all the uh, Iraqi infrastructure, talking up to the ground troops. And that's definitely what's happening in, in Ukraine uh, uh, at this time. My concern is that this is going to become an incredible grudge match, and that uh, civilian populations will be, in fact, deliberately targeted. In the 20th century, in every war, since World War II, more than 90% of the dead are civilians. And that's not to say that, oh, it's just fine for soldiers to go out and die. No, I don't mean that in any way, shape, or form. But with the, the weaponry becoming so incredibly advanced, it's, it's mind-blowing. And I wouldn't be surprised if what starts happening next, trying to break the morale, uh, that you're going, I mean, the, the, the Germans did it to the British in World War II at the Battle of Britain, starting with Coventry and continuing on to Liverpool and, and London, et cetera. Uh, and the British and the Americans are going to retaliate the firebombing of Tokyo. Mm -hmm. More Japanese die in the firebombings of Tokyo than die in the combined atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, on August 6th and 9th, respectively. 
1945. Uh, Dresden, Hamburg, it's payback in fairness uh, in this era of total war that you're deliberately targeting here civilian populations. You could say it's infrastructure, that's a phrase that we use, and indeed oftentimes it is. But by the same token, when you're going after Kiev and you're dropping these massive incendiary bombs and civilian populations, the goal is to kill as many men, women, and children as possible. It's, it's horrific. If history makes you anything, it makes you a passionate humanitarian. If we dance on this planet for far, far too short of a time period. And at the, at the end of the day, you want to preserve, war is inevitable, but you want to keep the peace for as long as possible. For the saying goes, there's, there's no such thing as a, 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 a good war or a bad peace. And I would agree with that. Other questions? Oh, yes. Oh. Why um, the West let Russia get away with taking Crimea? That's a very good question. It's a very good question in terms of at the time, technically, Russia controlled the Crimea was part of the Russian Empire, okay, for 300 years. Initially, it was tied to Ukraine going back to the early 1600s. And you have these border disputes across Europe. And think about, for example, Yugoslavia. And with the breakup of all of, uh, nations in Eastern Europe, historians were royally freaked out about Yugoslavia just completely falling apart here. And uh, ethnic cleansing ended up being the, uh, the net result. So, so it's, uh, um, no, I'm sorry, I'm having a, a, a Tim Crane moment. What was, uh, I, I, I drifted off into Yugoslavia. What's that? Crimea. Crimea, thank you. So Crimea, so Crimea in 1654 became part of the Russian Empire. In 1954, in 1954, it was set up by Joseph Stalin just prior to his death that Crimea, that's where the Yalta Conference was held for the World War II buffs in February of 45, Crimea was going to go back to Ukraine 300 years later. Okay? So technically, Ukraine controlled it from 1954 onwards in this ever-shifting border. All right? So the issue then for the new Russians was, uh, uh, for the new Russian governments, is that no, this has always been part of ours. This is not negotiable, okay? trying to draw up where the, uh, uh, the borders go, et cetera. So I'd say it's flimsy at best, but the international community, in fairness to Putin, uh, did not really respond. I mean, at the time, uh, uh, the Obama administration was, was opposed to it and condemned it, but it wasn't the type of response that was in February of this year. So I think in fairness to Putin, he's like, wow, they're getting all bent out of shape. They didn't give a damn in 2014. But I think by the same end, his attitude was that, oh, well, it doesn't matter. I can knock Ukraine out in about two or three weeks. Well, that didn't happen. So now you've painted yourself right into the corner. And now you're in a, di you're in a difficult situation. Because you may be in a war that's a quagmire, like the Russians in Afghanistan. And there's really no way out to save face, respectively. See what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, so it's kind of like it, it depends on who, and you also have a large Russian population, so you take what's easiest first. But it is surprising that there wasn't more of, a, uh, and and I think that what I think is the international community, especially Western Europe, they follow the American line. If the Americans are on board with something, by and large, the West Europeans will follow suit. Okay? Starting with Germany and France right behind them. Britain has eh, an island nation; they kind of want to do their own thing. The Europeans are kind of hostile to the British because they're. British kind of want to be hanging on to the Americans, and sometimes they want to be hanging on to Europe. Okay, uh, it's been going on for decades, and you got you know Brexit, etc. So it, it's a different story. Yeah. Other questions? I think we need to cut off. We need to cut off. Okay, we need to cut off the questions because it's two minutes to eight. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys, for being here.